Hello, this is Chef John from foodwishes.com with Brunswick Stew. That's right, no one is going to believe one of the best recipes for this Southern classic came from a New Yorker living in California. So if you share this recipe, I'd probably leave that part out. And by the way, if you try this, I'm pretty sure you're going to be sharing the recipe. And when you do, just tell me you got this from a friend in North Carolina or Virginia or Georgia. Oh, and the other thing to mention is we're not going to use any squirrel. Oh yeah, sorry, no squirrel. But we are going to use some sliced up bacon. So to get started, we'll toss it into a dry soup pot set over medium high heat. And we'll cook that stirring until almost all the fat renders out. At which point we'll use that rendered fat to brown the rest of our non-squirrel meat. And we can do this in stages, by cooking the bacon, removing it, and then cooking the meat and the fat. But to save time and make this a little more thrilling, what I'll do when the bacon's about halfway cooked is make a space in the center, and I'll push all that bacon to the sides, and then I'll start browning my meat at the same time. And I'm doing two kinds, including one nice big thick pork chop that ideally came with a bone, and then in a few minutes, you'll see me add the other meat, which is going to be some bone-in, skin-on chicken thighs. And we're not really going to do a deep, dark brown sear on this meat. All right, we're just going to get a little golden brown color on both sides. And once my pork chop was browned up a little bit, I went ahead and pulled that out and added my chicken, skin side down first. And like I said, we'll get a little bit of color on that. And I should mention this entire step is optional. And the original versions of this recipe were almost certainly just dumped in a pot and boiled but I think even a little bit of browning does add more flavor. So I do it, since our bacon is cooking anyway. And if you're wondering, is this extra effort for that little bit of extra flavor actually worth it? Well, I can't really answer that, since this is a cooking lesson, not a philosophy class. So that is going to be up to you. I mean, you are for all the Hugh Laurie of your Brunswick stew's glory. But if we do brown it, once it's removed from the pot and our bacon is fully cooked, we'll go ahead and toss in our diced onion along with a spoon of salt. And we'll cook those during for a few minutes until they soften up and start to turn translucent, which usually looks a little something like this. And once that's been accomplished, we go ahead and toss in our minced garlic and we'll just cook that stirring for about a minute, at which point we'll stop and toss in a nice big can of diced tomatoes. Or if they're in season, of course, some nice fresh chopped tomatoes. And we'll go ahead and stir those in and of course, all those juices are going to deglaze the bottom, which means release all that brown down caramelized goodness. And as soon as we add our tomatoes, we can turn our heat up to high, and we can add a couple more ingredients, including some garlic powder, as well as some freshly ground black pepper, and we will give that a quick stir before returning our brown meats to the pot, along with obviously any accumulated juices, and by the way, the pork and chicken thighs in this recipe are the answer to a question you never thought you'd ask. Hey, how do we substitute for squirrel meat? Which along with things like possum and rabbit, or what this stew is traditionally made with, but I think we can get pretty close by using pork and chicken. Or at least I assume. I'll never really know for sure. But anyway, once the meat's in, we'll go ahead and pour in our water. Or if we want something a little richer, we could use a chicken broth. But since I got bones in my pork and chicken, I just went with the water. And it was really good. And that's it. All we need to do is poke that meat down below the surface and wait for this to come back to a simmer, at which point we'll reduce our heat to medium low or whatever setting helps you maintain a nice gentle simmer. And we will cook this for an hour and a half or until our meat is very tender and pretty much fallen off the bone. So that's exactly what I did. And about an hour and a half later, my pot looked like this. And I grabbed some tongs and I removed that meat to a bowl because what we'll probably want to do at this point is let that meat cool all the way down until we can handle it. And then we'll separate the meat from the bones and skin. And we'll add that back to our pot for a very user-friendly experience. And I said probably, because you don't have to pull the meat off the bone. We could just leave all that meat as is in the pot and just let it fall apart naturally. And if you don't mind picking around bones and skin, that totally will work. But as far as your guests go, this does make things a little easier and more elegant. So I did let mine cool, and I separated the meat and added it back in, followed by pretty much all the rest of our ingredients, including the very mandatory yellow corn, and of course lima beans. You pretty much have to include both of those. And yes, frozen and thawed is perfectly fine. Speaking of which, I'm also going to thaw some frozen okra, and toss some of that in as well, 
along with some diced red bell pepper, and then last but not least, some raw cubed russet potatoes, or the potato of your choice. And we'll give all that a quick stir. And I'd say only about half the recipes include potatoes. So depending on who you ask, those are optional. But I love potatoes, so I add them. And then we can also at this point add the rest of our seasonings, which will include some more salt, some cayenne pepper, and then just a little touch of brown sugar to kind of balance things out, followed by a nice splash of Worcestershire sauce, or as they call it down south, Worcestershire sauce. And other than one last secret ingredient, that is pretty much going to be it. Once all that's stirred in, we will simply let this come back to a simmer, and then we'll cook it for about 30 minutes, or until we decide it's done. And during that time, there's not really much to do. Although if you want, you can skim some of the fat off the top, even though some of my southern friends frown upon that kind of thing. But anyway, besides skimming some fat and giving this the occasional stir, that is pretty much all there is to it. And how we know we're done is that our meat is cooked exactly how we want, which means it's very soft, tender, and succulent. And if we added them, our potatoes are also nice and tender. So we will give this a taste and check things out. And if our potatoes have cooked long enough, and we're happy with everything else, we will add the last ingredient, which is optional, which would be about a tablespoon of cider vinegar, which is going to sort of brighten things up and amplify the other flavors. So I'm going to go ahead and stir that in and give it one more taste for seasoning. And don't be surprised if it needs a little more salt, which mine did, so I stirred some in and gave it a final taste. And that's it once we're happy, at least with the stew, We'll go ahead and grab a ladle and turn off the heat, and we'll serve this up. And yeah, some recipes do call for barbecue sauce, which there is no way I'm going to add to this, since it's been my experience that even a little bit of that will overpower the entire stew. But having said that, we did add just enough of the right ingredients in barbecue sauce, like chili pepper and vinegar and brown sugar and some Worcestershire sauce, to get the exact notes we want, without making this way too smoky and sweet. But anyway, we'll go ahead and serve that up. And then for a final touch, I'm going to do some freshly and thinly sliced green onions. And that's it. My take on Brunswick stew was ready to enjoy. And that, my friends, really is incredible. Although I would like to apologize to everyone that lives in the southeast for serving this without cornbread or biscuits. Or cornbread biscuits, if those are a thing. But even just eating as is, plain like this with a spoon, it really truly was fantastic. All right, we're talking about something that's very rich and meaty with a beautiful balance between the sweetness from the vegetables and the onions, and then the sweetness but also acidity from the tomatoes, as well as that little bit of vinegar we snuck in at the end. So while this is very rich and hearty, it is not just one-dimensional. There's actually a surprising amount of stuff flavor-wise going on here. And again, I would love to explain the difference between using pork and chicken and the original game meats, like squirrel and rabbit and raccoon and possum, maybe woodchuck, did they use woodchuck? But unfortunately, I may never know. And by unfortunately, I mean thankfully. But if for whatever reason you do find yourself in possession of a whole bunch of squirrel meat, I kind of hope you give it a try and let me know what I'm missing. But whether you make this as shown or your game to try it with some game, either way, this is a delicious, hearty, comforting stew. And I really do hope you give it a try soon. So please follow the links below for the ingredient amounts a printable written recipe, and much more info as usual. And as always, enjoy.